from the New York City area, welcome to the Badass Counseling Show, where the master badass himself, Sven Erlinson, takes you deep and gives balm for the soul, baby. Hello, badasses. It's great to have you here with us. My name is Sven Erlinson. You have found yourself today on the Badass Counseling Show, part two. Uh, to those of you tuning in from Japan, our friends in Japan, and way up in the Northwest Territories of Canada, all the way down to Tuscaloosa and all the way over to Phoenix, it's great to have you here. I am joined in studio, as per usual, with the fine young man known as Rob the Rocket. Rob, how are you today? Ready to rock, sir. Let's do it. Indeed. And, and we are also joined for the second show in a row, the rarity of KC not being in the booth, but being in studio with us. Hello, KC. Hello, Sven. How are you, young lady? I'm doing great. How are you? Uh, lovely. Thank you so much. Uh, this is part two. And the reason Casey is out of the booth is because this was her idea. She said, oh, we should have a couple on. And one thing led to another. And here we are with Marshall and Adina, whom we met uh, on our last show. Just to get everyone up to speed, um, uh, Casey's idea was, let's have a couple on. We'll hear from one spouse, then we'll hear from the other, and then we'll bring them back together for a show. And so that's what we've done. And in our last show, we spoke with Marshall first. And Marshall, we discovered, uh, was struggling with trust in his marriage. And he had been raised by a grandfather, uh, hero, World War II vet, all this stuff, and taught him trust no one. And uh, he uh, he had struggled with this whole idea of mattering his entire life and that so much of his worth was tied up in doing as opposed to being. And he's cheated on his wife uh, multiple times. And uh, as we discover, she's cheated on him as well uh, before. And he says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm cutting out the things like the ballpark and I'm immersing myself in learning about self and I've sort of become stoic and self-discipline and living with integrity. And I had asked them, and how is that chafing? And he said, oh, about 25%. Um, and, but he is committed to his wife and loves her and this is the person for me. And, uh, but he's struggling with trust. And then on Adina's side of the equation, um, she is struggling with sort of where do I belong and do I belong in this marriage? And uh, she's he's been cheated on many, many times. And uh, she's feeling like, you know, I've, I've kept going back and going back and accepting. And in part because she feels a lot of pressure, outside pressure, an uncle who's a pastor of a non-denominational church and the pressures of her religion of Christianity, don't divorce and adultery is bad and the guilt over causing him harm, but also the fact that these two have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight children from ages four to 24. And so the, the, you feel she feels bad for the children and so forth. Um, when asked the question, um, if uh, you did not have these outside pressures right now, uh, what would you do? And uh, it's rather interesting, her response, but uh, I'm going to let her tell that side of the story in a minute. Um, we're going to bring them in now. And uh, Adina and Marshall, I want to uh, welcome you back onto the show. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Ben. You bet. It's great to have you here. I want to ask uh, Marshall. Marshall, you have cheated on your wife many times, and you've said that in the last three, four, or five months, whatever it's been, that you're changing and you're doing all this self-work and so forth. Uh, you two have been married 25 years, um, multiple infidelities, and but now you're changing. And I guess the question I'm wondering is, and the change is great, but my question is this, why now? It's just that we've been in, caught in this cycle for the last 25 years, and it always harkens back to the old Albert Einstein saying of, you know, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, definition of insanity. So kind of started digging into the old interweb, was looking for alternate solutions to uh, change myself for the better. Uh huh. And but that doesn't technically answer the question because you had been caught in the cheating cycle, literally caught many times prior to this. And so I'm wondering why right. this time? Why now? 25 years later, just celebrated your 25th anniversary. Why now? 
I guess because I feel like she gave me the ultimate wake up call on this one. So she, okay, that, okay, fair answer. Appreciate your honesty. She gave me the ultimate wake up call and the ultimate wake up call was what? At the beginning, I was just catching her texting them, texting the person. And I was like, I'm not going to tolerate this. And I kept on and I like caught her again with like some, you know, picture pictures and stuff. So, so the ultimate, know. ultimate wake up call was that you realized she was cheating on you. No, I just feel like this, this situation just went too far for me. Like I, I'm not going to accept this anymore. But, but wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, I, I, I'm honestly trying to understand what triggered this sequence of events and uh, that this time it went too far. She had, had sought separation before or talked to a lawyer or whatever before. So that wasn't enough to get you to begin to change. It's only now that you've begun to change and you're changing now because fundamentally you saw that she was cheating. Is, is the sequence of events accurate? Yes, sir. Okay. So what is different this time, this, this time that ba this notion that the, basically the stakes are higher this time, I realized, oh, wow, she gave me, to use your words, the ultimate wake-up call. And the ultimate wake-up call was she was cheating. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So if I, and, and if I'm off, you tell me to go fuck a duck. I won't be offended. All right. I just want yeah. to understand and be accurate. I won't be offended. If you tell me no dumb shit, it's not that at all. I, I, I had five older brothers. Well, one was a sister, but uh, I've been called dumb shit many times so I can handle it. All right. So if I'm <laughs> off, you got the ultimate wake up call. So in other words, all the years of her pleading with you, all the years of her tears, all the years of the pain that she was feeling all the years of her longing for her husband wasn't enough. In the end, yeah, it felt bad. Yeah, you didn't like it. But in the end, I didn't give a shit. I didn't give a shit enough to change. But now that she's actually, it, it sucks that she did it this way. But I mean, you did too. So it's not like she, there's some, some moral fucking quandary here. But once right. she asserted her power, now, no, well, now I'll change. I'm not going to change if you're just in pain, but if you're actually taking back your power, well, now I'll change because fundamentally her asserting her power is her asserting autonomy. In other words, she's not dependent upon me. So I'm going to, I'm going to change so that I get her back is it, it, what am I missing? I, it's, I feel like maybe I'm missing something or what? The previous times when we had these moments, it was just like me being like needy and begging her back and buying her a whole bunch of presents or something like that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, it wasn't like this where I actually made a change in my life. Well, right. Of right. Any sort. Well, right. And, but the reason you said it yourself, the reason I'm actually making changes is because she upped the ante. She gave you the ultimate wake up call. You had, this was something you couldn't buy your way out of. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. Right. I so you, so. so you actually had to do something. Okay. I learned, learn how to learn how to communicate. I have no, I was, and I was given no emotional guidance like by my parents at all either. Like I, like through my whole life, I was just like, ah, and you don't need anxiety medicine or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. like that's not a real thing. Like you suck it up and move forward. Just like, you know, my mom said, so I've discovered all that plus everything else that I've discovered along this journey. Fair enough. Fair enough. And, and the fact that you were enculturated into believing those things conditioned you to believing those things is fucking horrible. And that's what parents do to children. But in the end, in the end, and when it comes to the relationship, in the end, you were making choices repeatedly again and again and again and again and again, a woman, 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 apart from your, uh, your wife, you were making all these choices that, Yes, I we understand sometimes why we're conditioned to make choices, but in the end, when you have to stand before this other person, sit before this other person, in the end, it doesn't matter. You hurt me, and you hurt me again and again and again and again and again, and you didn't make any effort to change till I fucking asserted my power. Okay, um, I just want to interject one thing here for our listeners, just so our listeners understand. I don't do marriage counseling this way. 
The way I counsel couples is I don't, I'd, I'd express this to Adina and Marshall uh, in the intro to the show before we brought on the listeners. I don't bring a couple in together early. I work with two individuals separately. My goal in counseling a couple is not to save the marriage. My goal is to help, to help two individuals become who they most authentically are. And then make the decision, do I want to live with this person? And do I, me, want to live with that person? And decide it as their authentic self versus their sort of adapted self or what they were conditioned to believe. And what Marshall is asserting here is that I have been living in this marriage as this inauthentic version of myself and because of what I was conditioned to believe. And so we're seeing evidence of what the fuck I'm talking about, that until you're actually being your authentic self, you can't actually choose the relationship on one hand. Yet... You did. And so where we're left, it is it almost seems like it's a it's a way a get out of jail free card on one hand. Um, and so the truth is what Marshall is saying is, hey, I'm enlightened now, I'm doing the work, I'm changing, and I know that I want her. And the interesting thing is, but as a result of all the decisions made by Marshall in that past state in his old self, if we want to call it that, as a result of all of those decisions of hurting this person he claimed to love again and again and again and again, and not just with the infidelities, but we as, as we discovered in the last show, by telling people about her infidelity, by informing one of the children about her infidelity, um, it was more than just the infidelity itself. It was the abject humiliation and so forth. And so she also, and Adina, you set me straight. If I'm missing it, you set me straight. Okay. She, I will. I will. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And so she was also living as an adapted self. What she was conditioned to believe, well, she had a mother who was abusive and she had all this shit from her past and she was taught. And again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Adina, but I think I heard you basically say to eat shit that it's all about everyone else's fucking feelings and I need to make other people happy. And so he kept cheating and she kept taking him back and kept taking him back and kept taking him back, which implies that while he has changed and he has seen the light and praised the Lord and, and now he knows what he wants, it's possible that she has changed and that she has changed and it's not just, I'm just gonna eat shit anymore. It's like, it's, it's, it's possible and she's still sorting it out as she admits, uh, but basically she has changed or... Let's, let's say it a little more clearly, is changing uh, as well. And so now we get back to that question that I had asked Adina and that I had put a hold on uh, at the top of the show. And the question that I had asked Adina was, you know, you, you have this pet, you this uncle who's a you know pastor and you have people in your life sort of telling you what to do and a divorce is bad, bad, bad. And if you leave, you're a bad Christian. God won't love you. And Jesus frowns on divorce and bad, 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 bad. And I said, if you were to remove all of the elements of people presuming to tell a grown ass woman how to live her fucking life as if you're a fucking idiot, which we know you aren't because you're a successful, strong, smart woman. But if you were to remove all the people who are convinced they know what's better for you than you do, what would you do? And Adina, do you feel comfortable answering that question or would you like me to tell the answer that you gave us or would you rather the answer not be said at all? You're welcome to say the answer. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I had asked her what she would do if she if we were to remove all the pressure elements uh, from her life and uh, that she would just do, what does she want to do? And she said, and I quote, and if I'm missing the quote, Rob Casey, uh, you check me. Uh, I would divorce and find a new life. So each of them is becoming a new person. Each of them is finding a new sense of self. Uh, each of them is realizing new things. Now, she went on to say throughout the show that, you know, but she also said, I'd asked her, well, what's God calling you to do? You said separate. She said two things. God's calling me to separate. But then the other thing is, if, it, if we discover through massive counseling that it is sustainable, then maybe we could be a help to others. Um, so the, she's not saying I am divorcing. She's just saying, you know, she's got mixed feelings. I don't know where I fit, etc. cetera. Uh, would those be accurate characterizations, Adina and Marshall? Yes. Yes. Okay. I've written a two volume book on infidelity and what happens after infidelity or it can happen after abuse. It can happen in any sort of relationship, but one very often in relationships, there is a power imbalance between two people. One person generally has more power than the other person. 
And oftentimes, if that person with the power is not uh, judicious and generous in their exercise of any power that they have, uh, what happens is they keep the other person down to their own benefit. And what happens is the, the person who has less power will eat shit, eat shit, eat shit, eat shit, eat shit, eat shit, until eventually they say, I'm not eating shit anymore, and they escalate their power. And then the person who formerly had all the power, they escalate even higher. Now in the past, that would work. And the person who was in the lesser power position, even though they had escalate, they would back down, okay? But what's happening in this case is fundamentally, Adina, by cheating, whatever her reason was, it was an assertion of her power, clearly, because now what we see in Marshall is a radical change of behaviors. So he's trying to reassert real power in the relationship, even though he claims it's not that, at the very least, what he's trying to do is get her back because he realizes she's more powerful. Somewhere in him, it registers she's more powerful than she's ever been, that she could fucking walk or she could cheat again. She has the power to hurt me now. Okay, it's like, you know, fucking US and Russia during, you know, the Cold War. It's mutually assured destruction. She can fucking kick my ass. Oh shit, I better straighten up and fly right. Okay, so what very often happens, and I've done a number of videos on this, is that often the person who formerly had the power will say all of a sudden, I've changed, Lord of Jesus, I have changed. And what I always tell people is, really, why now? You had 25 years and now you're doing it? Now you're doing it because you realize the stakes are higher. And I always tell people, and I'm sure it's not the case in this case, or probably not, um, and that is, it's not that they want you back. It's so that they can give you love. They want you to back so that you'll give love to them. And the really interesting thing is how long does the change last? And the real question that you gotta be asking if you're the person, now I'm not just talking to you, Adina, I'm talking to anybody in this situation. If you're taking someone back, the real question isn't whether or not they have changed. The real question is, have I changed enough that I hold their feet to the fire if they start to slip? See, if you're basing your entire relationship on a, uh, of 25 years of infidelity and pain based on three to four months of change, that's a hell of a fucking gamble. So what you better, you gotta have as ace in your hole. And I'm not saying he hasn't changed and won't stay that way forever. I'm just saying your insurance card is have you changed so that if he starts to slip a little bit or starts to be a jerk or whatever, you stand up and say, fuck you, fuck you. And I'm fucking out of here. And I tell you what, if you want to fucking do something about it, like hit me, please do, because I'll call the fucking cops. Or not, and you're not a hitter, Marshall. I, I, I'm just exaggerating there. But the point is, the question really in that equation is, um, do you, have you changed? Have you find, have found your power? So let me ask you this. I'm going to draw a line down the middle of my piece of paper right here. And I want to hear from Marshall. Marshall, what are the top five sins or pains that Adina has committed against you? that you are most hurt by or most resentful of, if you were to be totally honest? Unfaithfulness. However, I can totally understand. No, 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 no. Just the, the, okay. just the top five things that she has done to hurt you over 25 years. Betrayal. Okay. That's all I have at the moment. Okay. Um, well, then I'm going to stop you. That's all you're going to get. I'm giving you the chance to say five more because usually if people are bickering in a relationship, Christ, I spend half my fucking time thinking about what my girlfriend did wrong and I can list 10 fucking things of what she did wrong and by noon, I'll come up with 10 fucking more. It's interesting you can only come up with two. And I, I'll believe you if that's what you say. What has she done to fucking hurt you? And you said unfaithful and betrayal. Sort of the same thing, but I'll take them as separate. What else has she done to hurt you? Nothing. All right, fair. Uh, appreciate your honesty. All right. And then Adina, uh, I need to know the top five things that Marshall has done to hurt you. Um, abandonment. Emotional neglect. Unfaithful unsupportive and I, I'm not sure how to state this, but I'm going to say superiority. Okay. Fair enough. And just so I'm clear in the things that he said that you have done to hurt him, uh, do you take issue with unfaithful and betrayal? Do you, is he full of shit making it up? Is he off the mark? Is he wrong on those two? No, sir. So you concede that you have done those things to hurt him. That is correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Marshall, Adina claims that you have abandoned her. You've been emotionally neglectful, neglectful, unfaithful, unsupportive, and that you have treated her with a, uh, an air of superiority. Uh, do you take issue with any of those? And if so, which ones? 
No, so she's a hundred percent correct. She's a hundred percent correct. Okay. And so just out of curiosity, what do you guys make of those lists? I'm shocked he doesn't have more on his list. Why are you shocked well, by that? I don't know. I guess I was just ready for him to just come up with all the reasons that I wasn't good enough. No, in, in, reflect, in reflection, you've always supported me and been there for me. I agree with the superiority thing. I always wanted to keep you under my control. So, In that vein, Adina, you shared something uh, from very recent that he said. Do you remember what that was that you told us? I own you. And, and, and when was that said? This morning. Marshall, is she full of shit? I was saying I own your soul. That okay. was not the way it was phrased. You're saying it was phrased so it, as I own you, and Marshall, you were saying the phrase was what? I own your soul. Okay. And just so, uh, go ahead, Adina, you wanted to say something. Had the statement been made... At the moment, I own your soul, it would have elicited a different response from me than the three words, I own you. And it was repeated multiple times, in fact. And, and I understand that he had meant it in a different context, but there was no clarification until much later. And so I sat with this awful heaviness and this immense feeling of being trapped and unable to, honestly, to breathe for the whole morning because I felt like those words just consumed me in that moment. What does it feel like to hear, and, and I'm gonna hear your side in a second here, Marshall. What does it feel like to hear, Adina, I own you? I'm gonna go with your side of the story to start. What does it feel like to hear the words, I own you? I felt hopeless and helpless in that moment. Like I was, never ever going to be an independent person or able to do the things that I might want to do because I feel like I am forever going to belong to him no matter what. So when he said that, you believed him? I did. And just so I understand, all right, I don't know what that's like as a woman, as a wife, uh, to hear those words, I don't know. So I'm asking you to educate me. What is it in him saying that that causes you to believe him? I have expressed to him many times that because of our, not, not just our situation together, but the fact that we have eight children together ties us together for the rest of our lives. Agreed. And regardless of the outcome of our marriage, we will deal with one another forever until our children are able to take care of themselves and then probably still. But it may, it's a very overwhelming feeling to, see, to feel that you are so trapped and consumed by another person that you are never going to be able to have options in your life other than what he wants and what he feels and what he thinks is best for me. And so I felt panicked. Panicked is the best word I can say. Makes sense. You had said your response would be different if he had said, I own your soul. Uh, what would the response likely have been and why would it have been different? Because I feel like what he meant was, is that, you know, we are so entangled in one another. It almost seems as if, and I think I made this statement earlier that we don't know how to live with each other, but we don't know how to live without each other either. And so it's a very encompassing, trapping feeling like there's no escape, no matter what. Even if we divorce, I'm still going to have to deal with his mess for another 20 years of my life or until I'm dead, one of the two. And so if he had said to me, I own your soul because we are soulmates, we are connected. Mm -hmm than to place himself between my legs on the bed and not let me move and say, I own you. Uh, I just felt like it was a dominating moment, like a moment where he was trying to say, I own this situation. I own you. I own what happens. I own how this outcome turns out. What was the physical position that he had you in? I was sitting on the end of the bed. 
my, my legs dangling off the bed. And he came and stood right between my legs and in my face and said, I own you. I asked him if he would please just let me get ready. Let me fit. I was running late. I needed to get ready. And he pursued me and stood right between, approached me and stood right between my legs and just, he said, I own you. And it just flew all over me. And I, I, and it made me really upset. So, um, like I said, had it been phrased in a different way, perhaps I wouldn't have taken it so harshly, but it felt very threatening and very superior. Okay. I'm going to uh, shift it over to to uh, Marshall here. But before I do, um, from my perspective, and this is just me, and I'm not in your marriage, so again, I'm going to fuck off. Uh, if for me, and I 100% hear you, and I can understand how you would feel trapped and to feel consumed and so forth. Uh, as an outsider, after the fact, it's to me, it's almost worse to say, I own your soul, Marshall, because you guys being Christians and all, you're fundamentally saying, I'm supplanting God. See, God owns souls, I believe, in y'all's you know religion and your variety. So it's like, I'm your God now. So, but again, that's just my ridiculous fucking moronic interpretation. So what, again, uh, tell me then, Marshall, she remembers it. No, I remember exactly what the fuck you said, motherfucker. It was this morning and you said, I own you. And so, but Marshall, you got a voice here too. What did you say? I was pretty sure that I said, I own your soul at the beginning. And then she was just like, you don't own me. And I was like, yeah, I do. And she said it a couple more times. Then, Wait, so then, you're con you're conceding then that you changed. You said, I said, I, I, you're claiming, I said, I own your soul in the beginning. You use the phrase in the beginning, which implies you changed your tune as time elapsed, whether it was one minute or 10 minutes or whatever. I changed my tune to, I own you. Is that, am I, is that accurate or inaccurate? I never physically said I own you. Okay. But when she's saying, you know, you said you own me, you're not denying it. I changed it to more like I got you, like I got you because- I could feel like I knew how to feel her emotions instead of listening to her words. And That's what, what, what emotions was, did you feel coming off of her in that moment? Oh, in that moment, for sure, she was angry at me. Okay. We're going to come right back to this in just a minute, uh, right after this short break. I've been going to therapy for years and spent thousands of dollars. Then I began counseling with Sven and bam, it was like someone turned the lights on. I could finally see the connections and links that I had been looking for to identify where all the pain was coming from. The writing for therapy was essential, even though it was uncomfortable as hell. Because once you figure out the source of the pain, it's so much easier to heal and learn from it. After this, I picked up a copy of his book, There's a Hole in My Love Cup, and the systems were fluid. Thanks, Sven, for writing this unique gift. It's changed my life. This show provides soul counseling intended to entertain and inform and is not medical advice. Now, back to the badass. We are back with Adina and Marshall, um, and we're right down there in the thick of it. Uh, just this morning, um, as this man who has changed, he said to her, uh, according to her, I own you. And according to him, I own your soul. Adina says, if it had been that, I would have responded differently. You, you said, I own you. In whatever the case, Adina felt trapped, consumed, hopeless, and helpless. Let me ask you this. Uh, if you were to be totally honest, Marshall, what are the odds that Adina is going to eat shit tonight for saying these things on the show? Zero percent. I see. If... Adina were to seek a separation and I'm not pushing for one fucking agenda over the other. I don't have a dog in this fight. As I said, I'm trying to help two individuals become who they really are. But I also know that when one person is losing something that's very important to them, that they've always sort of had in their back pocket their whole life, their whole adult life to the idea of losing that is very scary. And it can become easy to exert power to not allow that to happen. If you were to be totally honest, to what degree would you be likely to uh, use whatever tools you could to keep an eye on her or to um, uh, keep her from leaving? If you were to be totally honest, Marshall. 
the only way I would keep her from leaving is just I'm just going to show her that I'm not going to give up on this. I see. And so she and she would confirm that if I were you think she would confirm that if I were to ask her? Yes. Okay. Adina, I'm going to ask you. My question is this, Adina, to what degree do you believe him? To what degree would you feel safe? I do not feel like he would exhaust any options to watch everything I do. He's in the past four months already had me tracked and followed by a private investigator, had my phone tapped. So I have zero confidence that if he decided that I was breathing incorrectly, that I would be tagged and followed immediately because he has the financial whereabouts to do it. I see. Uh, Marshall, you want to respond to that? Is, is she full? Is she full of shit? No, no, no. She's not full of shit. That was in the. That was four months ago or so. That was definitely out, living out of fear, big time. So you are to, not you know, living out of fear now. That if she wanted to at least separate to be able to fucking breathe, you wouldn't be afraid. I'm not afraid, but I do not. I'm not. I'm going to stand my ground and not leave her. No, 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 no. We're talking about if she wants to separate to leave you to create space. Even just to separate, what would your response be? No. No what? No, that I would not I would not leave my home. Oh, because that no came. Oh, so you would not leave. So the only way you're gonna she's gonna separate is she's gonna have to leave the home. Yes. And the reason for that, just so I'm clear, is what? Because I'm not gonna give up on this. But if she believes it's in the best long-term interest to actually give her a chance to breathe and assess that maybe she does want the relationship or maybe she doesn't, that if this would be best for the relationship, you are not going to concede that. You are not going to give ground to what she may believe may be best long-term for the relationship or for the family. You are not going to concede that ground. Is that correct? That is correct. So then the notion that she expressed that you expressed superiority and potentially control, that hasn't changed. No, sir. I see. So you are convinced, just so I'm clear, that you know better than her or that it's not even about who knows better. If she's doing something that I don't want, I'm not going to let her. It's more of the latter uh, as... That if she's doing something that I don't want, I'm not going to let her. Is that accurate? Well, I'm not or inaccurate. Not that, not that I wouldn't let her. It's just that I'm just going to show that I'm just going to be strong in my convictions that I want to be with her, and I'm not just going to leave. No, but she's I'm not. Gonna, she's not. It's not that you're just going to leave. Everybody knows you're not just going to leave. She's asking you to step out so that she can have some room to breathe. And it, and she's not actually asking that. I said as an if. All right, so I'm not putting, Adina, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you had brought up the, the notion of separation previously in the relationship, and so I'm bringing it back up again, and she's saying, I need room to breathe. Will you please step out? And I think the fact that you fucking cheated on me a whole bunch of times over 25 years uh, allows me to make this request, and you're saying, no, fuck you. Well, we have been living together this whole time during this sort of halfway separation how, hey, wait, how is this a halfway separation? I'm, I'm, I'm unclear. Well, my half doesn't want to be separated for one, and we're living under the same house still, so. So that's a non, that sounds to me like a non-separation. Not, it's not official. But I, I mean, I, uh, separating literally means separate. How are you two separate? Well, we don't I mean, sleep I'm, in I'm, the same room anymore. I'm on the couch. Okay. Um, and I guess... <laughs> You're, when you say, uh, when you say, Marshall, that I'm not leaving, so even though she's asking you to give her room, to, hypothetically, because she hasn't technically said, I want this, Sven. Or, I she, actually have. Okay, but I presently, sure I, I'm asking, pre, I, I don't want to put your, I just don't want to put words in your mouth, Adina, for presently, that's what you want. If you do, then we can operate from that. But I just don't want to put words in your mouth for right at, this moment you want a separation right okay gotcha but, but if you do then say it and, and we can go from there i just don't want to put words in your mouth I, so, so i'm speaking hypothetically that if she wanted a separation you would say no can i um offer you an outsider's perspective yes sir go ahead all right from an outsider and i and i'm gonna if rob or casey want to check me on this they can but from an outsider's perspective, I think pretty much most of the people listening to this show, when they hear you say that, uh, Marshall, no, 
I'm not leaving. And it just sounds like, honestly, it sounds hypocritical as fuck. It's a, it's it's saying I've changed, I've changed, I've changed, but no, fuck you. You're, you're not fucking leaving or I'm not fucking leaving. And this isn't what I want. And you even said it's more that, you know, if it's not what I want, I'm not going to let it happen. You say I'm standing on my beliefs, but it really comes off as bullying and standing right in front of someone between their legs, whether you say I own you or I own your soul, that's fundamentally an act of aggression. And to say that you've changed over three or four months, first of all, it's as an outsider. And, and if you guys follow my shit, you decide to come on my show. So I would hope you've at least looked at some of my shit before you choose that. That when I say people have changed, there's no, you, you got a 25 year motherfucking pattern of behavior. And now you're going to tell me in three months, I'm a different man. It's just, it's, it's, it's asinine. The change doesn't happen that quickly, especially if you ain't counseling with me, you're counseling with me. There's a shot. But there's no fucking way after a 25-year pattern. It's hard to believe. And then this morning, you stand between her legs in an act of aggression. You didn't say it from across the room. You didn't take five steps back. Do you know that being a guy who's six foot four, 275 pounds, I literally, when I'm in conversation with people, I literally will sit down if they're standing. Or I will drop the volume of my voice to not intimidate them. Or if I'm making a strong point, I will literally take two steps backwards because I'm conscious of the fact of how intimidating I am, just physically. Not that I'm an unusual jerk. I mean, I can be, and I'm not real bright, but I literally take that into account. If I step between my girlfriend's legs and said words, I own you, in any way other than some playful bedroom banter, or, you know, or, and she's just like, my girlfriend would laugh and say, oh, that's fucking funny. I, you see these testicles here? These are mine. I own you, bitch. And I'd be like, okay, you're right. I'm sorry. No, I'm teasing. But the point <laughs> is for to stand between a person's legs and say, I own you, or I own your soul, whatever. That's an act of aggression. That is not the action of a changed man. That's just you, any, any gains you made. Over the last three or four months, it's like, fuck, you just threw him out the window. And to say, no, I won't let you leave. No, we're not doing separation. That's not an equal relationship. That's just you fucking asserting your fucking dominance. And the truth is, if we're all being really, really, really honest here, it works. It works. Your dominance of her works. And it's worked for 25 years. And this morning, yet again, it worked again. You sent her into such an emotional state that she felt fucking trapped, consumed, hopeless, and helpless. And you don't deny it. And the thing is, you got to wonder who this really works for and how long a human being will take it. And see, the problem is the mere fact that she has said she wants a separation, that is a complete, devi at, at some point previous to this, that is a complete deviation from her patterns of behavior in the past. That says that something so significant has happened that she deviated from her patterns of behavior. In other words, the pain had gotten so fucking bad, I'm gonna do something that would make my uncle think I'm a fucking piece of shit Christian. That's how bad the pain is. You have pushed me to such a motherfucking point that I'm ready to separate you. So if she's willing to do that, then it's only a matter of time that if you continue to assert your dominance, your superiority, your emotional neglect, unfaithfulness, unsupportiveness, and so forth, it's only reasonable to assume that if she's already at, been at that point, it's reasonable to assume she will reach the point where she will divorce you. And see, this is where it gets really fucking interesting because then we find out what sort of man you really are. We find out if you're the man that when he doesn't get his way, or when everything's not under his control, does he turn violent? Does he, let's say, hire someone to follow you? Does he start bad-mouthing you to other people? Does he try to undermine your character? See, you claim, Adina, that basically you have faithfully served this man and his children for 25 years. You claim that. Is that an accurate or inaccurate characterization, Marshall, that she has served you and your children for 25 years? Is that accurate or inaccurate? That is accurate. She's been awesome. And your greatest complaints about her is that she cheated on you, I believe, with, in, with one person and the sense of betrayal from that. And so despite yes, 25 years of service to you and to your interests and to your children and her children, of course, 
that there is a possibility that you would exercise aggression towards her if she chose to leave. She's done everything to serve you for 25 years. But if she left, fuck that shit. All bets are off. I'll hire a fucking private investigator. I'll tell our children that she cheated. I'll tell fucking family friends that she cheated. I will undermine her character. I will fucking humiliate you. What does that say about the man engaging in those behaviors? He's a piece of shit. Or at the very least, he's engaging in piece of shit behaviors. Serious piece of shit behaviors. And that ain't love. For you to hire a private investigator, for you to have her followed, and she claims you had her phone tapped, for you to do that shit while simultaneously claiming, I have changed, loud of Jesus, it's bullshit. It's fucking hypocritical, controlling bullshit, all right? Now, Marshall, you're a really good guy insofar as you've tried your best despite all the shit messages you got. Growing up, and I acknowledge the power of those shit messages, but you have wreaked immense destruction upon over 25 years over on the person that in the last three months you claim this is the person for me, I want to be here. She has a 25-year pattern of behavior and a three-month pattern of change. If Vegas were giving me odds, normally I'd, I'd bet my left testicle, I'd bet my left testicle and my right testicle that you aren't changed just because you got a 25 year fucking pattern of behavior, okay? And so what I'm saying is sometimes we show true change sometimes when we let go of our power, when we trust the other person. And the truth is, and trust in this case, you talked about trust and you talked about trust and you talked about trust. And and the truth is you have a one-off from when she cheated on you. She has... I didn't really get a full count on the number of times you cheated on her. So if anybody has a right to not trust, it would seem it's her. Not that her response, and she even said this, my response in cheating on him was not justified just because he cheated on me a lot. So she acknowledged that. But nonetheless, I think anybody, any outside observer would be like, well, what the fuck? Okay, um, so I guess where I'm going with this is, what do you believe, Marshall, would be the loving act, the truly loving and trusting, you said you want to trust, but you also want to be trustworthy and so forth. What would be the loving and trusting act to do in this situation if your wife, she said if, and we're still in if stage, said she wanted this separation? What would be the loving and trusting act? Would it be to hire a private investigator, have her followed, have her phone tapped and tell her children that she cheated on you? Or would it be something else? It would be to honor her wishes. And let me ask you, if you're to be totally honest, what is the difficulty level for you in doing that? What percentage? Is it like 98%? Is it 14%? How hard would it be for you to honor, actually honor her wishes and, uh, and allow, I hate that I'm using that word, but allow that? 75% right. at this moment. Right, right. Because of fear, right? Yes, sir. Terrified. And that primary fear operating in this situation is what? Just losing her forever. Right. And the truth is, but the fascinating part is you didn't give a shit about that 10 years ago when you cheated five years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. You didn't give a shit. Or you were willing to roll those fucking dice. I want both. I want this incredibly faithful woman with an incredibly fertile womb and a great mom and whatever else. I want this fucking woman and I want to bang the fuck out of somebody else and not just fuck these other women, but tell them I love them. All right, and so let me ask you this. Is it possible that what's keeping you holding so tightly to her is that at least in part, you won't end up being alone like grandpa? Like, 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 my, like my dad was? Yeah, or like dad was alone. Yeah, yeah. Is that possible? That's part of it. That is absolutely part of it. Right. And so I would rather control another human being rather than having to face my fear. That my pain, I am justified. My fear of my own pain justifies me in inflicting pain on this person who I'm bigger than and I can sort of rough her up with my words and saying things like that and engaging external sources to control her, that my fear of my pain justifies my inflicting emotional, significant emotional pain and fear onto her. That's fundamentally what you exhibited this morning. 
I agree. Yeah. I'm sorry. And the truth is, I'm sure the, I'm sorry. And I'm going to, yes, I'm going to let you speak here, Adina. I, I am so fucking sorry. It's just, you were a bit tentative to speak your truth before. And it's just like, okay, I just can't hold this shit in anymore. Um, so I'm going to let you speak here in a second. I, I got to be honest, after 25 years of getting your ass handed to you, it, me getting my ass handed to me, somebody turns me and says, I'm sorry. And it's just like, it doesn't matter. Do you know that I get clients sometimes who, uh, I had a client earlier uh, this week who said, you know, my old man never said that um, he loved me, never said he loved me, never said he loved me. And then when I was 25, he said, he, or no, he, 35. When I was 35, my dad said, oh, I love you, son. And I got angry. I said, why'd you get angry? He says, because it's like, fuck you. Fuck you. Where was your I love you 25 fucking years ago when I was 10? Fuck you. Where is your change fucking actions? Fuck you. Let me ask you, Adina, when he turns to you right now and throws out those words, I'm sorry, what feeling? Give me a feeling word. How does it feel? It feels ingenuine. Because? Because I, I feel like it's a manipulation and not a true emotion. I feel like it's an attempt to make me feel better in this moment, but later on there will be a, you know, a comment or a phrase that will be used to make me feel the same, it, it, but it will be used in a different way. I just feel like it's a, it's an ingenuine moment to get through it. And then there will be something else in a little while. And that was, that was my fear earlier when I said, what are the odds? When I asked them, what are the odds she's going to have to eat shit for all of this later that she said on her, uh, she said that, you know, I just got told this last night that we're going to be on the badass counseling show and so forth. And, uh, in we accept some of the responsibility because I believe we notified you just in the last like 48, 72 hours because we had a cancellation. And so that is partly on us because, and so, but um, I had asked you, Marshall, what the odds were that she's going to eat shit for this later. Because just this morning, this man who claims to have changed, seen the light and all that stuff, was intimidating his wife. So I guess, and and has exhibited intimidation in terms of tapping phones and so on and so forth. I have to be 100% honest with you guys right now, all right? They call it badass counseling for a reason because, yeah, because unfortunately there's shit I got to say. Adina, or I got to ask, Adina, what percent do you, f and do you feel safe after the show today? I feel physically safe. Okay, fair. Physical concerns have never been a problem. Fair. Uh, for either of us. Fair emotionally, I have never felt safe. So that doesn't change after this episode. Wow. You are a tough broad. Um, I'm, I, and I mean that with the highest respect. Um, wow. Uh, because I feel unsafe for you because it's, it's just Marshall. When we change, we want someone to believe us. And I know you want her to believe you. And I know that you want to believe it too. It's just that it's like the boy who cried wolf. It really is that simple. It's like you've been claiming shit for 25 years, but you've been hurting her in the very next breath or in the very next action. It's just so I, hard, so hard to believe. Go ahead, Adina. What? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I just wanted, ahead. you know, I want to give him credit for I've seen him work really hard and study and read and go to counseling for himself and have life coaches and all the things in his corner. And it's not that I'm not proud and appreciative of the work that he's trying to do. And I acknowledge that work. I don't feel like I have the opportunity to do the same. Mm -hmm. Why don't you have the opportunity to do the same, Adina? I feel like we are so incredibly, first off, so incredibly busy in the logistics of life with eight children, first of all. Sure. Um, but you have the very, same, the same logistics exist right. when he's getting counseling. So I'm just curious why you don't have the access to that. I started counseling for myself three weeks ago. Um, took me a while to, uh, to get that started, but I have started and today was my third session. So I'm trying to get some help for myself and some guidance for myself. But you were making sort of a bigger point that you feel like, you know, he's been able to do this over three months, but 
it, it's not like you're not able. It's almost like you were saying that, what about me? Like it's being withheld or, it, fuck, I hate to say it, but like he wasn't granting you permission or some shit. Is that accurate or inaccurate? That's accurate. Okay. Uh, I feel like he has the financial stability and access to funds to do the things to have the support system in place. And I feel like if I do the same, it's going to be held against me because it's not my money. Marshall, or wait, 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 wait. Okay, uh, Marshall, is it going to be held against her if she uses uh, the family funds or are those funds your funds? Well, there are the family funds. Would it be held it against be held her if she used uh, family funds for the same or similar or roughly in the same food group, uh, self-development, uh, the same funds, same amount of funds that you have uh, that you have used, would that, would you come down on her? Would you use your power to make her feel bad? It would not be held against her. As and, I, I, I feel like I would spend every penny to get, to save this. And so. yet she's saying this, isn't that odd? It's almost as though she's fucking lying. Well, I think she has, she could use the opportunities online, but I think she wanted more of a face-to-face -face approach. And, and so, so why can't she have a face-to-face -face approach? She can't. That's what she's doing currently. But it, we started out in the counseling together at the at one place, yeah. and then we stopped. And, and it took her a while to find another place. Well, hang right. on, let me clarify. We didn't stop. He quit because because he said it wasn't the narrative he wanted. Uh, it wasn't going the way he felt like it should go which is precisely which is precisely what he just said about 25 minutes ago when he said if i don't get it my way and if things aren't going the way i think they should go i would say no and i'm not going to leave the house well you're offering up evidence that he did the exact same thing with regard to counseling yes okay so i have to believe marshall that potentially and i could be fucking wrong the fuck do i know uh, that this session with us is not going the way you anticipated it going. Is that accurate or inaccurate? No, this is the way I anticipated it going. Oh, did you? Okay. All right, fair enough. Uh, let me ask you, though. She said that in the past, Adina, and you correct me if I'm wrong, Marshall, you correct me if I'm wrong, but you said, Adina, that in the past, if I wanted to spend money on shit for me and my own development, it would not be allowed. Is that accurate, Adina? I would say that in particular, my schooling has been held over my head for a very long time. He did pay my school loans off, but it was with, uh, it came with many, many years of comments over my school loan bill and how my family couldn't afford to pay for it. But his, you know, his is all paid for and taken care of, but I had a good amount of school loans and I took a lot of comments and, Regarding my school. Okay. And then, well, then it, it must be true then that you said same things to him about when he's spending money on like his counseling or shit for him. You must have been saying the same things back to him. Is that accurate or yes, inaccurate? No, that's accurate. And you did that. And I was actually being facetious. I, I didn't know that. So in the past, he's saying that now, no, I want you to have it and you can do whatever you need to do to, but you're saying in the past, no, that didn't fucking exist. I wouldn't have been able to do this shit. He could have, but I couldn't have. Is that accurate or inaccurate, Marshall? In the past? Yes, I would not. I didn't even like uh, acknowledge that emotional problems existed, however. Right. And so when she's saying, if she had said in the past, you know, I'm maybe having emotional problems or I just want to take some time for myself or I want to, I just need a getaway trip. You'd be like, well, that doesn't exist. You'd be like, Request no. denied. Right. And, and so what I'm just going to fucking just fucking lay it out here. The whole fucking power structure of this relationship has to change. It doesn't work and it is not long-term viable. You are exercising domination over a person in every pay way you possibly can to fucking own her shit. And financial, fucking emotional, as we saw just as recently as this morning, and so forth. And whether or not you've changed, okay, great. But for 25 years, she there's a very strong pattern in place. And so this woman has been scared. And some guys get off on that. Some guys get off on, great, because now my needs are being met. And now this person will do what I want. And I will forever have a person pouring love into my fucking love cup. 
And the idea that, wait, I got to pour love into her love cup. I'm not going to fucking do that until you got the ultimate wake up call. And it was only when she cheated, when she exerted her power, it's like, oh shit, fuck, I better pour a little bit of love in there, at least enough to get her back to pouring love into my love cup. Because I don't hear change when you exert dominance over a person and, you know, and you have them fucking follow and you fucking, you know, dominate them in the morning and I fucking own you or I own your soul. Um, uh, I got, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm inclined to believe her on that one. Uh, just because it sounds like a fudge to say I own your soul, but that's really not even the point. The point is, is exercising dominance. And so it's very hard for listeners. I guarantee you, my listeners are like, that's bullshit. He hasn't fucking changed. He's just trying to win her back and get her back under his thumb. And I'm going to tell you, this, re this relationship goes one of two ways. As I see it, and I can be fucking wrong. The fuck do I know? Um, it goes one of two ways. And the two ways it goes is either um, Adina you fucking change and you go back under his fucking thumb. You get rid of this whole notion of you having feelings and your feelings mattering. You get rid of all that shit and you just go back to doing what the men in your life tell you to do, all right? Would you just fucking be a good Christian girl or some shit and just fucking do what you're told and let him go back to telling you what you're allowed? That word's disgusting in this situation. You either go back to that, which is fundamentally what's being asked for here, if you're being dominated even as recently as this morning, or Marshall, you have to let go of fucking controlling and dominating another human being. That's the choice. Because if you continue to dominate and control and intimidate her, you're, you're breaking, you're just breaking a human being. And we've already seen that she will seek separation up to that point, which implies if you persist, 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 it's only reasonable that her spirit is fine, her God-given spirit is gonna finally rise up and say the scariest word in the English language. And that is, no, no, enough, enough, I'm done. And see, then you're confronted with a choice. How angry are you gonna fucking get? You think you've no fucking anger? I always tell people you don't know rage in your partner till divorce is involved and there's money and kids involved. You've never seen Marshall's rage. Hell, Adina, you've never seen your own rage till you get involved. You've never seen Marshall. You've never seen the rage. My, my, my daddy, he had, and in the North, we don't call him daddy, but my father, he had a saying, one thing you never want to see in life is a nice man angry. You got a nice wife. And I'm not saying, oh, she's perfect or some shit, whatever. That's not what I'm saying. She comes off as generally a nice person. You don't want to see that kind of person angry because all it takes is her beginning to believe in herself and a lawyer that can enact what she needs to do. She's Because she's got nuclear fucking weapons. You tell your kids shit, she, she has 25 years of shit. She can tell your kids. And then, see, then you get into really risky territory for you, Marshall, because as a man, if you can't control your anger, you might potentially get so inflamed that you do something maybe you've never done before. Maybe you hit her. Maybe you do something and see, then the police are involved. And not only the police, but you're in the military, so the military police. See, now potentially there's crossover. Now you've just done all sorts of shit. But here's the one thing we've lost. And so something's gotta happen. Either you gotta fucking relinquish some trust and do the very thing you're most afraid to do, and that's the trust. And to begin to actually confront your fears of your fucking past, because that's what's driving you here, Marshall. Either that's gonna happen, or Adina, you just need to go back to shutting the fuck up. Now, I don't advocate that. I advocate, Marshall, you need to work on, truly work on your shit of getting at and getting out those fears, because here's the real fucking thing in all of this. The real, if I'm being really cold, <laughs> you probably thought I'd been fuzzy and warm up till now. If I'm being really cold, I couldn't give two fucks about either of you. I care about eight motherfucking children that you guys are teaching them that this is what love is. You are teaching them that this is what fucking marriage is. You are teaching them that this is how men treat women. You are teaching the girls Adina, that this is, boy, this is what a woman is. Just eat it and eat it and eat it and eat it. Marshall, you're teaching your daughters that this is what you can expect, girls. So guess what your daughters are gonna choose? They're gonna choose that which is familiar. You are normalizing this for your children. So when you get all pissed, 
15 years from now because your daughter's husband is cheating on her and you get all pissed. Well, that piece of shit. And I'm from the South and I'm going to fucking go over there and I'm going to. Yeah, right. You fucking taught her to eat this shit. You guys are fucking normalizing this shit. You guys are teaching your children that this is what love is. So spare me the Christian bullshit. Spare me the Christian bullshit when behind closed doors, you are teaching your children that this is what love is. There is no definition of love under which this fits. None. There's no definition of good parenting under which this fits. Now it's time to do the goddamn work. It's time to find your spine, Adina, and I know you got it there. You are a strong, fierce woman and you're a good, loving woman. Marshall, it's time to find that soft spot inside of you and to let go of trust and to be, go into your own fears and to begin to work on that because that is causing you to choke the very person you claim to love most. You are choking her, her soul, to use your word, her spirit, her emotions. You are fucking choking the fucking life out of her. Now, KC, you want to weigh in? The first thing I want to say is that I believe he can change, but in order to prove that he can change, he has to be willing to let her go. It seems to me that he's not allowing her her own autonomy, like just to be herself. And and true love is not that. I mean, I don't want to sound cliche, but you know, if you love something, let it go. Hey, uh, hold on, Marshall's raising his hand here. Go ahead, Marshall. I was just saying that I was pretty much uh, letting go of the outcome, but I wasn't going to let go of her. That was kind of my strategy. But you don't get to control if she goes. And that's that's the thing. That that was the really disturbing thing. Like when you said that I said to her, no, she can't go. I was I was a little bit outraged as a woman because, or even as a human, because you don't get to say if I stay or if I go. He, he was technically saying, I won't go. I'm not leaving the house. The only no, way it's, no. Oh, that, I'm referring to him saying no. When he said no, I... She can't go. Is that he, accurate, Marshall? Uh, if we roll this back, you'll see that he sh said no. He she didn't, can't go. Oh, I thought he said okay. no. You can't. Well, okay. Anyway, what? Go ahead. Yes, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. What he's referring to, if I and if I'm wrong, he can say so. What he's referring to is, I can leave, but I'm leaving, and I'm leaving my children here. And he's keeping the house and staying in the home. And I'm going to have to leave everyone behind. Right. And I can leave. Yeah, that's some cold shit right there. And I have right to there. leave my children behind and the home behind. And I have to leave. If I leave, it's under those terms. Wow. And I'm not leaving my children. Of course no, not. He, he said on two separate occasions, and I don't want to go back and forth on this, but he said, number one, request denied. Right. And then he said, no, I say no. One of the notes that I wrote was that while she was talking in her session, she was really worried about hurting your feelings, about about that leaving you would hurt you, right? More than once she said that. But I, but I haven't right. heard, but I haven't heard that from your side. Um, and I think that you should show her the same selflessness and let her go. Maybe she'll come back. Maybe she won't. But. You have to make it okay for her to leave you in order for her to want to stay with you. Because honestly, I think she's just staying with you out of fear. And do you want someone Boom. on those terms? Like, Boom. I would never want someone to stay with me out of fear. I want somebody to stay with me while I hold them with an open hand because they love me and they want to be around me and they trust me and they want to be intimate with me. But right now... I feel that this woman that you cherish, and I do believe that you cherish her. I believe you when you say that you feel she's the one for you and she's your soulmate and, and everything that you said. I, I believe it. Cherish, at least in his feelings, in if your not feelings, in his actions. Right, okay. not in your actions, but in your feelings. And, and if you really feel that way, and if you want to show her the same selflessness that she has shown you, then you have to be willing to let her go. And I think that's going to be really hard for you. And so when Sven says that, you know, when he counsels people, you know, in couples counseling, he doesn't, he doesn't counsel the couple. He counsels the two individual people. I think that that's what the two of you need. I don't think you need couples counseling. I think you need counseling on figuring out what it was that your, your parents did to you 
and how it affected you and also about your control issues. And I'm sorry to say it, you have control issues, like serious control issues. Um, you are, you are exerting dominance over this woman in, in every way. Uh, first of all, the, the idea that she looks at your community money. I mean, you guys have been a couple for 25 years since your kids yourself, you have children this age. So can you imagine that she right now thinks of your money as your money and not both of your money is ridiculous to me. I mean, you guys are so tied up in each other. You have eight children together. Every penny she makes and every penny you make is communal money because the majority of what your life costs is your eight children. So, so if she needs money in order to get healthy or to go on a vacation because she needs to be alone or to feel like in a divorce, she's going to have an apartment and you're going to stay with the kids. I mean, I don't think that's what you want because I think she's been probably the primary caretaker of your children. So to say that you're going to force her to leave is not only hurting her and you, but it's destroying your children. Mm. Whoever has been the primary caretaker is the person that should be left with the home and the children. And that's not to say that that then gives the primary caretaker no any way. right to cut out the other no, parent. Both but parents, you're not saying that. No, both parents deserve to, to be in a relationship with the kids. But to, to try to force her to stay with you by using your children is just wrong. That's fundamentally using your children as leverage to assert your will. You're using them as a pawn, and if you'll do, if you'll use your children as pawns before a separation or a divorce, that indicates, guess what? You do it in a separation and a divorce, and that's some hardcore fucking manipulation where my own feelings and my fe uh, fears matter more than the potential effect on the person I claim to love and my children. I will manipulate anyone, even my own motherfucking children, to get my way, and the real fucking problem, and I'm gonna get back to you in two seconds here, Casey, the real fucking problem now is that now you would actually have to hack into our computers and pull this video down off of YouTube and to take it off our podcast. See, now your children have access to, even though they don't know your names because we have changed their names, they now have access to the full fucking story. And so that means if one of them finds the story and you are then continuing to dominate or control or manipulate your children, or in a divorce or in a separation, they will see it. You have, you've basically exposed yourself and now it's out there. So the leverage belongs to your children. And if you use them as pawns, don't be surprised. And I see this shit all the fucking time. They get to be 30, 25, 40, and they're like, get the fuck out of my life, old man. You fucked us over. When you were married, you fucked us over in the separation, you fucked us over in the divorce, or you guys stayed together and you fucked us over the whole time, fuck you, I want nothing to do to you. And then your very greatest fear comes true. You're a miserable old man whose fucking children don't even fucking want him. And whose wife, if they're still married, tolerates him at most. So you create that by continuing to choke. Go ahead, uh, Casey. It, I was I was divorced once. And in Connecticut, um, what they do is they have, before you're able to do the proceedings of the divorce, you have what's called a cooling off period. And in the cooling off period, they make you counsel with, with a, like a child counselor, somebody that ch counsels you regarding how you guys separate or divorce with regard to how you treat your children. I realized in that class that I was using my kids, okay? My husband was the one to, to leave me, okay? And I realized in subtle ways that I was using my child with him in order to control him. And when I had that realization, I stopped doing it. But I'm, I'm admitting to you that I'm guilty of exactly what you did. Okay, but you can change. You can you can have that realization that you used your children and you can use this experience to change and not do it again. And so if you guys whatever you guys decide to do, I think that you you might endeavor to first of all counsel separately, but also to get get somebody to counsel you about your kids. You know, and how you go through this period and how you I'm, you interact with them because you don't want to hurt them. And counseling for the kids themselves I, or something. Go ahead, Marshall. What? I was just sad to apologize to my daughter for dragging her into this thing and altering the 
image of half of her soul, basically, I understand what I could have, the possible ramifications of what I did to her and you as well. Yeah, and and the truth is that in the end, you know, the, the cycle of abuse is, and I'm not saying you're abusing your wife, but potentially emotionally, it could be argued that you are. The cycle of abuse is the action of abuse and then the apology and then the action of abuse again. And eventually the person being abused or taken advantage of or manipulated or controlled uh, begins to see through the, as basically you said, Adina, it's just like the apology. It's just, and these are Sven's words, she didn't say this, but it's like, shove your apology up your ass. It's like, fuck you, just spare me the bullshit. I, I, you know, I'm sorry. It's cause it's like, you're not changing. You're not changing. And, it, and to then simultaneously say, oh, I'm changing, I'm changing. It's like, um, no, you're not. I always tell people, you know, in my book, there's a hole in my love cup. Trying to change behaviors never changes behaviors long-term, never. Behaviors, actions are up here on the surface. Until you change the core beliefs that are driving those behaviors, those changes in behaviors won't stick. Which is why I tell people, if you're waiting to see if someone has changed, don't look at their behaviors. The only, just look at time. Let time elapse and see if those behaviors stick. Because if they don't, it's because they never change the core beliefs. And the truth is, if you have a 25-year fucking pattern of behavior preceded by your 20 years, you know, your first 20 years of your life where you were taught that you weren't shit, and then you've exhibited 25 years that you're just gonna hurt, you know, the person you claim to love the most, you've really got a 45-year pattern of just just like not liking myself and hurting. And if you feel you don't matter, the way I matter is by getting all these other women to tell me that I matter and they love me and so forth. Boy, that solves, that balm is balm to that wound of childhood. Uh, but the bottom line is, the bottom line is, is you guys got some serious fucking work to do. And it's not work on your marriage. That's just a bullshit throwaway fucking statement. You can't work on your marriage yet. You have to work on your own individual selves and you both have to have the liberty to do that and fucking to focus on the kids and all of this. It's like, you guys, your childhood shit in the case of both of you isn't just destroying you and each other. It's destroying your fucking kids. The bag, the secret's out of the bag. Mom's cheating, dad's cheating. It's all out. Give room, do what you got to do, create room, be kind and solve this because you're just, this is scorched earth shit right here, man. You are destroying everyone around you, most importantly, the most vulnerable. So some of you got to be strong, some of you got to back the fuck off and let go and it's just like, we got to solve this shit. You guys got to fucking start hardcore solving this shit, this sort of coasting along of what's going to happen, uh-uh. Let me ask you guys then. I'm going to ask you each. Uh, Marshall, you go ahead and go first. Uh, any questions for me, for us? Any final thoughts, uh, Marshall? We came on here for trust. And I've realized through this conversation, like my grandpa and grandma are still both alive, 97, right? And I kind of realized that not only modeling him on the lack of trust, I've done everything exactly like him. The controlling, the dominating, the belittling, all that shit. So that's going to be some good journaling and fucking letter writing later on. Because now I'm kind of angry at him again. Yeah, and you're but, modeling your mom too because you cheated on her all these, on your wife all these times, just like your mom cheated on your dad. And that, by your story, drove dad away and he ran away. Um yeah, that's uh, okay. Fair enough. Uh, Adina, any final thoughts or questions? How do you suggest we proceed from this point? That's a fair question. And I'm just going to give you what I think. You asked, I'll answer. I think you guys need a fucking separation, a physical fucking separation. Marshall, I think you should get a fucking apartment, to be very honest with you. I And she hasn't asked for it. You just asked what the fuck I think. I think you both need some fucking time. Adina, I think you need room to fucking breathe. My mom only raised six kids. You're a goddamn superhero raising eight. All right. And I know my mom got to her fucking forties and she was run down, especially since her sixth kid is just like this giant fucking cattle prod right up her ass. That was me. But the point is, is it's, it's terribly hard, but you're a career woman as well. And all this and all that you, I mean, then, and, and you know what, honestly, honestly, and the thing is the separation would be good for you, Marshall. To, and you know what? Honestly, I'd put a fucking tap on your phone and I would give her access to your fucking phone. Yep. You want to win her trust? Win her fucking trust. Prove to her that you don't have a burner phone as well. 
I would let her tap your fucking phone. You have, I mean, if you want her trust, then you got to fucking, you got to be an open motherfucking book, but you need a fucking apartment. Why? So you can fucking work on your own shit. Not so you can hustle other women. All right. Or, you know, whatever. But it's just like, yeah, give her room. If she wants room to, if, and she hasn't said it this time, but if she wants room to breathe, you got to fucking give it to her for fuck's sake. Let go of your grip around her fucking throat. But also don't invite all your friends in and telling your fucking stories to your family, the other person's best friends or whatever. Talk to your fucking therapist or your fucking pastor or whatever, which raises another issue. Adina, you, I'm sorry, you have to begin to tune out those fucking voices. You have to give yourself whatever space you need. I'm granting you permission. Not that you need it from me, but tell your uncle is not your fucking owner. He does not speak for God any more than I speak for God or any more than my fucking puppy speaks for God. Nobody speaks for God. We're all just doing our best trying to interpret what's been passed down to us. And he's fumbling just as much as any other pastor. And as a former Lutheran pastor, I can tell you every pastor is just doing their best. But the notion that he fucking speaks for God or anybody else does is bullshit, okay? And so you okay. need to give yourself whatever fucking mental separation or physical separation. Don't go to fucking Easter if you don't want to go to Easter with the family, all right? Or whatever. But you have to give yourself physical room, uh, mental room to hear your own voice. Because here's, here's the bottom line. When Jesus was on the cross and died, a very symbolic act happened. All right? Whether you buy that it happened literally or metaphorically isn't the point. What happened? The temple, the curtain in the temple was rent in two was torn into. Most people are like, okay, whatever, that doesn't mean anything, except it does. Because in the Christian story is that there was a curtain between the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was, and only the high priest could go in there because why? That's where the high priest talked to God. Then the high priest would come out from behind the curtain, real Wizard of Oz shit here, and he would say, this is what God's saying. This is what God is saying, and he would tell the masses. So in the Christian story, whether you think it's bullshit or real, literal, metaphorical, whatever, the curtain in the temple is rent in two, and the significance, the symbolism of that is it's no longer the people are out here waiting to hear what God's saying, that God is fundamentally saying, you now have access to me too. I'm removing the curtain that every individual can have a personal relationship with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, or with God or with the Holy Spirit. They're all God, so pick one that is more you know, palatable to you. But the point is this, God speaks to you directly through that inner voice deep inside of you. And no one, no one, no one can tell you what God is saying to you. No one, except that voice inside. And for the atheists who I have that listen, or the Muslims, or my Jewish following, or whatever, just call it your voice inside, your intuition, what I call soul. And then, if your soul is calling you to something, Marshall or Adina, and you don't follow it, and you believe that that is the voice of God speaking within, then you are fundamentally saying, I am more afraid of Marshall than I am of God. I'm more afraid of my uncle disliking me than uh, not honoring the voice of God inside that this human being is scarier to me than the voice of God. And I can understand humans can be fucking scary, but in the end, what do you fucking believe? And do you have the balls to fucking act on it? Listen, I love you guys. You guys were great. You ate a fuck ton of shit tonight, Marshall. You walked into a fucking buzzsaw. Um, <laughs> but you guys got some hardcore right. shit to do. And I created this. Yeah. And, and the, two, the truth is, to some degree, two people create a relationship. But yeah, you really fucking made it worse. And yeah, Adina, you cheated on him. You did. But Marshall, the, the giant elephant in the room is you got a 25-year pattern of behavior. And no three months of supposed change is going to change anything, especially when just as recently as this morning, you wiped away the last three months. You, and and so, here's, so here's where you have a chance to begin to lay the foundation again by giving her trust, by giving her room, by fucking showing what love is rather than what your fears are, to show what a man really is. And a man isn't someone who dominates people, especially the people who claim to love. See, I was taught by my World War II generation parents that, that the strong have a responsibility for the weak, the rich have a responsibility for the poor, that the strong have a responsibility for the widow, the orphan, the outcast. 
that the ones with power have a responsibility to empower, not lord my power over them, but to give away my power so that the weak might become strong. And so you're defining your definition of manhood and that's what you're teaching your daughters and that's what you're teaching your sons. And it's like, do you guys really want this to be what they think love and marriage is? Because Jesus fucking Christ, you, they, no, got a, they got a miserable fucking life ahead if this is what you really want to fucking teach them. Listen, I love you guys because you have the balls to sit through all this shit. And I admire you for listening, but you, you got to listen inside for yourself and have the courage to hear your voice and have the courage to let go when you need to let go, but stand up when you need to stand up. Any final thoughts? Oh, it's been awesome and eye-opening. Thank you so much. You bet. It's time I, to get to work. You're welcome. And Adina. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you having us on. Pleasure was completely ours. Thank you so much. And to everyone, all of our uh, followers and listeners around the world, on behalf of KC and Rob, have a kick-ass day. The Badass Counseling Show is strictly copyrighted. No copies may be made without the express written consent of the Badass Counseling Show, LLC. The Badass Counseling Show is produced by Karen Camparelli and Robert H. Friedman. Executive producer, Sven Erlinson. Original music by two-time Emmy Award-winning composer, Trevor Morris. Have a kick-ass day.